Good evening. On behalf of the Action Lab, I'd like to welcome you all to the Freedom Forward Film Series, which is our, our virtual series bringing together social impact storytellers, social justice practitioners, and artists dedicated to imagining a world with freedom, justice, and well-being for all people. We are very pleased this evening to bring to you Vibravio, Vibravo, a New Yorker, native New Yorker, Chileno filmmaker who has spent over 25 years sort of, you know, tracking, documenting the intersections of culture and politics across Latin America. His first documentary, which he co-produced with Loira Limbal, was Estilo Hip Hop, which looked at the sort of revolutionary roots and expressions of hip hop across different Latin American and Caribbean nations. And he spent 25 years in the field of film and film education, bringing social justice voices to the mainstream. So we're very, very pleased today to have Virgilio Bravo with us um, at the screening of Primera. We're also really pleased, we'll have joining us from Chile today, uh, Mariela Santana, also known as Male Santana, who's the lead attorney for Podepu, a legal defense firm specializing in the protection of human rights for Chileans. Throughout the uprisings that you'll see depicted in the film this evening, Mariela represented over a dozen families whose relatives were tortured and killed at the hands of Chile's armed forces. Her legal work in fighting for justice has helped frame the present day conversation on how the new constitution should address and protect the human rights of self-identified women. So I look forward to having Mariela join us and Vi Bravo, thank you for being with us. Thank you for sharing your film and thank you for your work. Um, v is gonna be in conversation with Mariela sort of leading us very briefly into some context around how this film emerged, but also its political significance for and its relevance given Chile's current political moment and also some of what's happening across Latin America. Um, so I wanna, I wanna bring V to the stage and just allow him to offer us his thoughts on his inspiration um, and, and what he thinks the sort of politically urgent and also politically emergent themes are uh, that are both depicted in the film and actively sort of calling us to action at this time. So welcome V, it's good to have you. Thank you, Mari Nieves. Um, thank you, Action Lab, for having uh, me tonight um, and hosting our film. Uh, I look forward to having a conversation with Male uh, when she gets on. Uh, it's a different time zone in Chile, and I believe Male is transitioning from work to home life. So hopefully we can give her a couple of minutes. But uh, I'll start by just mentioning or making some, I guess, observations. Uh, I'm going to speak with the assumption that the folks who are here tonight uh, have an interest or involved in community organizing, uh, are paying attention to obviously the political currents that are sort of like underscoring our existence here in the U.S. right now, um, and you know have maybe paid some attention to some of the developments in Latin America over the past few years. Um, so just some brief uh, background on me: uh, I, I was born in Chile, uh, but was displaced by the dictatorship of um, 1973, and uh, my family wound up you know, uh, immigrating to New York City, where I grew up, came of age, um, and also, you know, had a background in um, housing, organizing, uh, starting with my mom and the work that she did at, with ACORN uh, in the late 80s. And uh, I got involved doing some of that work. Um, and then as I transitioned to, you know, journalism and doing a lot of um, sort of like uh, media activism around hip hop and uh, mass incarceration and, um, and, and, and these issues in the mid nineties uh, to like early 2000s, uh, I was connected to things that were happening in Latin America. And at that point, hip hop had become this vehicle for the youth to kind of like, you know, manifest their ideas, their visions, right? For a just society. Um, so I say all of this is because uh, although I've been in the US for quite some time, I've always sort of like had these connections to my native Chile uh, through my work um, in film my activism work and and definitely the the hip hop journalism aspect, which was was global in many ways. So uh, fast forward to 2019, uh, I'm at home in New York, right, uh, going about my business, and uh, I see that my native Chile it makes the front page of the New York Times. This is, you know, glamorous image of like all these like rebellious image of all these young high school students uh, jumping over the train um, with signs that said, you know, like, you know, 30 pesos, right? 30 years of repression. So uh, I was like, wow, 
the young folks must have definitely lit something on fire, right? Uh, to kind of like make global news. And their analysis was pretty poignant, right? It was like, it's we're protesting a 30 cent fare hike, um, but we're also connecting that to 30 years of this neoliberal model that was instituted with democracy. Um, and then as I read the article, I realized that, you know, in, in, in true, you know, like right wing form, the president of the United, uh, of Chile deployed the military to quell the protests by 14 and 15 year old high school students. Um, and uh, upon reading, realized that, you know, uh, I had family and cousins who were, you know, up in the mix and getting involved. And uh, at that point, I think, you know, like home um, called me and, you know, had this conversation with myself and, uh, you know, what can I do? What is my role? Um, so at that point, I, I pretty much just, you know, stopped what I was doing. And within a, a week, uh, I managed to um, get down there to Chile with uh, the homie Rod Stars from the group Rebel Diaz, who's also Chileno. And him and I just went down to Chile in uh, early November 2019 at the onset of the uprising to um, just, just get a sense of like what was happening and, and record, you know, as much as we could. We, we wanted the story to get out there. At that point, I think no one knew that, you know, the student uprising would turn into a massive like six month people's movement. Um, and you know that that went from like protesting, you know, a thirty cent fare hike in, in in the subway system to demanding that uh, the country take a vote on a new constitution that would be be eventually be written by everyday people. Um, so I think you know our our goal was to just document right and make sure that you know uh, whatever atrocities were taking place that we could share them in real time with the rest of the world. Um, and then we wanted to stay in there for a couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, we, we know what happened in early 2020, right, with the pandemic. And, uh, you know, we, we almost got stuck in Chile uh, filming and following some of the characters that you're going to see in the film. Um, and eventually, you know, uh, stood there for about a year traveling back and forth, uh, building connections with the people you're about to see in the film, uh, some of the protagonists who are frontline organizers, um, including Mariela Santana, who I think just joined us. Um, she was a human rights lawyer, uh, taking on a lot of cases on the streets, uh, responding to you know, calls from families whose young kids had been brutalized by you know, uh, police um, with either tear gas bombs, right? Uh, there was a practice of like the military uh, shooting protesters directly in their eyes. There's just an egregious amount of violence towards, um, you know, nonviolent protesters. So Mariela was one of the folks that I met through CODEPO, which is a legendary human rights uh, organization in Chile dating back to the era of uh, the Pinochet dictatorship. Uh, and they represented, you know, like thousands of families and uh, political prisoners. And, uh, and then through Male and through other folks you connect in the film, uh, I began to kind of like, you know, begin to tell the story of a people's movement that started, you know, in support of the students that had protests at the 30%, uh, 30 cent fair hike. And how, you know, that within three months, this, this, there was this an, an incredible narrative shift work on the ground, right? When labor started showing up, when the education sector started showing up, when, you know, the, the health industry started to show up, when the indigenous communities began to like, sort of like lend their support um, to the protests. And then we realized that, wow, things are bubbling. And then within a year, right, this, this, this groundswell shifted over into a, a, a vote on a new constitution. Um, and, uh, and, and then Mariela, who is in, an attorney, Mala, as we call her, um, you know, helped me understand, right? You know, just what was happening, you know, um, be behind closed doors to get a to get on this to get a sense of like the, the politics at play, right? Like, you know, what what would the Chilean um, authorities, um, the elite, what were they conceding to in, in in allowing, you know, like you know, the people to kind of vote on a new constitution, and then um, obviously, right, the the minute that that you know, vote did pass, right? And, um, you know, 150 something people began to write the constitution, 150 people that were voted on by everyday citizens through a national public site. There was then this other process kicked in to sort of like stabilize that process, which ultimately led to the rejection of, of the new constitution um, in late 2021. Um, but I um, wanted to see if Male was on here. Male, ha llegado. 
Hola, hola. Hola, Mariela. Ok. Eh... Estoy, estoy con un problema con la cámara y estoy intentando... Estoy bueno, intentando eh, Mariela, estamos, estamos en vivo. Eh, ah. eh, hey, folks, I'm here with Male, who um, is on, but is having trouble with her camera. Um, but she is live with us in audio. Uh, I'm going to ask her a few questions, catch her up, and then pause, and then translate back to the group. Um, and, um, okay, so Action Lab, folks, uh, are we ready to start with Male, even though it's audio? Okay. Um, so, as I mentioned before, uh, I met Male. Um, she is one of the story participants in the film, and she had been doing incredible human rights work, right? Um, defending and uh, representing um, people who were protesting on the streets. Um, Male, eh, eh, le conté al grupo que está con nosotros hoy que yo la conocí a usted cuando empezó el estallido, la revuelta. Y usted estaba sí. eh, trabajando, obviamente, con CODEPU, representando a los manifestantes que eh, habían sido eh, atacados por policías, por militares. Y, y de ahí nos fuimos conociendo y eh, ambos fuimos viendo este proceso que eh, empezó con la protesta eh, de los 30 pesos y se convirtió en algo mucho, mucho más grande, que fue este, este empujo eh, nacional eh, para llegar al plebiscito. Eh, entonces, ahora le quería hacer la pregunta a usted. Eh, que cuando el plebiscito eh, ganó en el 2020, eh, había una energía dentro del país de que hemos llegado, eh, estamos cerca de por fin eh, tener esta nueva constitución para reemplazar la constitución que escribió Pinochet. Eh, ¿cuál, ¿Cuál era la vibra? Eh, en, 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 ese, en ese tiempo, eh, eh, ¿era una vibra optimista? Eh, el, ¿El país en sí pensaba que nos, eh, iba a llegar al, al, a la prueba? Yo creo, hola, hola a todos, yo creo que, que sí, había muchas esperanzas puestas en, en este proceso constituyente, que no, o sea, no era la solución a, toda la, a todo el levantamiento social del 18 de octubre, eso hay que dejarlo súper en claro, el levantamiento del 18 de octubre eh, no iba a ser solamente resuelto con una nueva constitución, pero, pero sí representaba un, un gran paso, el, el, el enterrar la constitución de Pinochet que fue escrita bajo cuatro paredes y con una constitución ilegítima y que se perpetuó y que perpetuó este sistema neoliberal eh, era un tremendo avance que finalmente no, no prosperó. Ok, de, de, deje eh, traducir, por favor. Um, ok, so um, I just asked Male, you know, um, within a year we get to, you know, galvanizing the masses to put pressure on the Chilean elites, uh, political elites, to hold the vote in a new constitution. And in October of 2020, uh, after a year of protesting on the streets, people go out and vote and uh, over 60, no, over 80%, close to 80% of the entire Chilean population votes to approve the writing of a new constitution. So I asked her at that, at that point, right, like, you know, What was the vibe, you know, like, how were people feeling? Did people feel, like, optimistic that finally they were going to they were gonna be able to, you know, undo, uh, you know, Chess Constitution? And she said when the uprising began, um, they, they were clear that this wasn't just about, you know, like, re, rewriting a new constitution. But first and foremost, right, uh, as she said, burying the old constitution that was written during the Pinochet you know, dictatorship. Uh, which was an illegitimate, illegitimate constitution and kind of putting that constitution to an end. So irrespective of what the vote uh, would be, uh, right, uh, uh, down the line, uh, we felt like it was a critical step to just first to get rid of this socially binding document that uh, you know, was written illegitimately and written during the dictatorship for the benefit of a few. So, so she feels, although um, the you know, eventual, like, written constitution failed, right, um, that it was a good first step. 
Uh, ok. Male. Eh, ¿Y me escucha? Aló, aló. Male, male. Oh, I don't know if Male can hear me. Male, si me escucha, me da un signo. Eh, well, while her, I'm sorry, folks, while she is attempting to get back on. Um, so, you know, her and I were talking about, you know, the, what happened like when folks voted and the vote to write a new constitution passed, there was a sort of like general optimism that, you know, like we had gotten there. Um, but I think here she comes. Male. Me escucha? Aló, aló. Okay. Sí, le ¿Puede? Eh, ahora quería darle cómo se llama el espacio ahora para que usted se presente oficialmente. Folks, now that she's here um, <laughs> in camera, I'd like to give the space to introduce herself. Hola, hola, buenas tardes. Pero, disculpen los problemas, los problemas técnicos. Eh, tuve que ingresar con el celular. Eh, yo soy Mariela Santana, soy abogada, eh, abogada jefa de Derecho Público del Código y abogada de Derecho Humano desde hace eh, más de 20 años. Eh, eh, y, 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 y represento en realidad como un, un, un puente entre, entre las violaciones, bueno, eh, los defensores de derechos humanos de dictadura y los defensores de derechos humanos eh, de hoy, porque en Chile se están hablando los derechos humanos, estamos eh, presentando un testigo de la más grave relación a los derechos humanos de la vuelta de la democracia en Chile. Y, y he tenido eh, un, un rol durante el estallido. Eh, con los equipos de trabajo del CODEPU de poder articularnos articular los equipos de trabajo y poder asumir la representación de tantas víctimas miles de víctimas en realidad que fueron eh, eh, violentadas por, por eh, los agentes del Estado durante el estallido social eh, Ok, okay um, Gracias Male So, um, she um apologizes for the tech issues and some of the sound issues um, she had to connect um, to this streaming platform on her cell phone. Um, she is a, an attorney who works for CODEPU. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they're an organization that fights for human rights. And um, she's been doing the work for over 20 years. And she wanted to mention that, um, you know, her work straddles between uh, defending the rights of political prisoners um, during the dictatorship era and um, supporting and advocating and defending the rights of the political prisoners of the uprising that she wanted to make it clear that prior to the uprising, there was already a movement in Chile for many decades to also free uh, the political prisoners that were still, you know, in prison for, you know, manifesting themselves, right, during the dictatorship years. So um, she said that the uprising kind of put her at the intersection of history. Uh, and today they've represented like thousands of uh, victims, families, um, you know, during the uprising, um, just all the egregious violence that I mentioned earlier that you will see like in the film. Um, so, you know, Male, you know, was doing that work on the ground. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, she is one of the characters in the film that kind of will help you kind of like understand sort of the chronological order of everything that happened within a year. Um, but I wanted to kind of like, you know, use this time to also get her feedback is because we, we had gone through this process of like, you know, getting to the vote. And then um, they gave the constitution writers, I think about a year and a half to like, you know, put together a draft. And this past December, 2021, um, they, um, no, 2022, I'm sorry, um, in September, which is a couple of months ago, they voted to, you know, Chile went to the polls and were asked, do you want to vote in this constitution? And um, the constitution failed about 
60-40. voting in like, no, we don't want this constitution and 40% voting um, for. So I wanted to engage in a conversation as to like, what happened? You know, like what were the forces at play? You have all this sort of like national groundswell. 80% of the populace voted to write a new constitution. How the hell like it goes to only 40% voting for it in a short year and a half? Like what happened? So I'm going to ask you that question. Um, Male, quería hacerle mm -hmm. esta pregunta básica y no lo podemos quedar en este tema porque solo quedan como unos 10 minutos. Eh, llegamos al voto al plebiscito y la constitución, eh, el apruebo para que se escriba la, la, la constitución. Y dentro de un año, un año y medio, llegamos al voto eh, ya que tenemos este borrador con esta nueva constitución y... 38%, solo 38% del público eh, vota por el apruebo de la Constitución y un 62% vota por el rechazo. ¿Qué pasa dentro de un año y medio donde casi 80% de la población votó para que se escribiera la Constitución y después solo 38% eh, por ciento de la población vota para que la Constitución pase? ¿Qué, qué pasó en, en ese año? So what happened in that year? Yo creo, eh, yo creo que se conjugaron varias cosas. Eh, por un lado, eh, el hecho de que el sistema que está instalado desde la Constitución del, de, del 80 está muy arraigado. O sea, hay, han, han, han pasado tres generaciones eh, bajo esta Constitución y ya eh, eh, la sociedad chilena está acostumbrada a vivir en las condiciones en que estamos viviendo. Aunque demanden eh, condiciones más dignas, tienen mucho miedo al cambio, hay una resistencia al cambio. Y hay un sistema, y el sistema, este sistema neoliberal está, está en la piel ya de los chilenos. Entonces, eh, por un lado, claro, está el, el, el anhelo del cambio, pero también está el miedo a, 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 a lo nuevo. Otro, otra cosa que también influye fue la campaña del terror eh, por parte de la derecha. La derecha en Chile eh, es, es muy poderosa, eh, eh, la derecha domina todos los medios de comunicación, eh, los, los, los hegemónicos, y hubo una campaña desde el primer día de, de, de que empezó a funcionar la, la convención constitucional eh, de deslegitimarla. Eh, de, de una campaña con, con, en base a puras fake news eh, y eh, una, una suerte de, 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 de terror y de, una, de terror en el fondo a lo que significaría una nueva constitución eh, para los chilenos. Eso también se suma a que la izquierda en Chile y que la, la convención también hizo su propio trabajo, no, no, no se articuló bien eh, eh, algunos constituyentes eh, no hicieron muy bien el, el, el trabajo y, y durante todo el transcurso del de, de proceso constituyente no hicieron, no estuvieron a la par de la, de la contra campaña de la derecha. Ok, so again I asked her, you know, what, what happened in a year, how do we go from, you know, voting to write a new constitution and in a year and a half the majority of Chileans vote to reject the constitution that was written. What happened in that process? So she mentioned three things. Uh, one is that uh, Chileans as a society as a whole uh, became accustomed to like living with this constitution that was written during the dictatorship era. Um, and it was normalized. So sort of like um, repressive relationships that exist between you know capital and citizen, state and citizen, right, uh, became normal. And uh, people got in, got comfortable just kind of like you know like living within within that within that space. So there was an element of like, well, why do we really need to change things, right? So that was a a narrative that um, was emboldened um, in in the narrative of the right wing media. So the right wing media also uh, began this sort of like campaign of like misinformation. And you know a campaign of fear mongering, um, and then as some folks might imagine, you know they linked the new constitution to, um, you know, this neoliberal model of like you know 
you know, you, you, you've earned what you've made, you know, people want to take away your homes, right? People want to introduce socialism again. Um, there were references to Cuba and, ben and Venezuela. Um, and um, so there were a lot of fake news, right? And, and, and that sort of like, you know, got people like really, really kind of fearful of, of, of voting for the constitution. Um, and at the same time, you know, the, the left, right? Uh, the political left, also has some missteps where they um, sort of like, you know, made some comments, uh, it put them, expose themselves, right, to um, certain, you know, like, you know, criticisms uh, that stuck. And, um, and, and, and then it led to just, you know, an, an overall fear of, you know, this, this structural change that the Chilean constitution uh, promised folks. Um, okay, in, in ahora, today, um, what, what what is the mood in Chile? ¿Cuál, cuál, es, cuál es el sentimiento en Chile? Eh, ¿Hay optimismo? Eh, ¿qué, qué, where does the country go from here? ¿En qué camino va el país ahora? ¿En qué camino va el país? Bueno, eh, asumió un gobierno eh, eh, supuestamente progresista eh, pero al cabo de unos, de, de, de unos meses eh, estamos en presencia nuevamente de mucha represión policial, de un espaldarazo a las fuerzas de, de, de orden y seguridad pública. Eh, eh, las, condiciones, eh, de, de, las condiciones de vida de las personas no han cambiado, al contrario, estamos frente a una derecha eh, está gobernando desde la oposición, que está condicionando las decisiones de la autoridad política eh, eh, a las votaciones, por ejemplo, en el Parlamento. Eh, hace, hace poco eh, quedaron, eh, se había votado en el Parlamento eh, eh, el dejar sin presupuesto a todo el programa de derechos humanos, o sea, se, eh, estaba, se, estaban rechazando eh, el presupuesto para para la reparación de las víctimas del estallido, estaban rechazando el presupuesto para el Nacional de Búsqueda de Detenidos Desaparecidos, para el, el, la mantención del Museo de la Memoria, de los sitios de memoria. Entonces, estamos en presencia de una derecha muy fortalecida eh, que no tiene ninguna intención de que se dicte y que se, que se trabaje en una nueva constitución. Eh, Estamos ante una, nuevos sucesos de represión policial, sobre todo ahora de los, de los estudiantes secundarios, y, y hay, tanto, hay muchos contentos. So, Malis says that, um, you know, there is, Chile did vote um, a progressive president, um, Ariel Boric, um, but she says that, you know, Chile hasn't really, um, undergone any any noticeable structural change um, that one life really hasn't hasn't changed for most Chilenos um, in terms of like the rights that they've demanded in housing, health, education, uh, and if anything, you know, uh, this progressive government has um, also taken a role, you know, kind of governing from the middle, and um, and they've backed police. Um, as police have gone back out to the streets, right, to quell all the protesters who are not happy with his government, right, uh, and the fact that, you know, he hasn't really done anything with his executive uh, powers to undo some of, like, the inequity that existed in Chile. Um, but also that the right wing has really, um, you know, um, taken this moment in time to um, just revitalize their base, and uh, on the political level, um, they've seen um, the right gain traction in wanting to defund um, the, uh, you know, the, the, all the kind of like legal services that are done on behalf of political prisoners and defund all the state sanctions, you know, like um, legal um, organizations that support uh, political prisoners. Um, and, uh, and then at the same time, uh, not wanting to uh, fund uh, or support, not fund, support um, the needs 
uh, the medical needs of some of the victims from the uprising, right, who need medical support, uh, continued medical support for the injuries they've endured. Um, and also, you know, uh, the continued criminalization of high school students who uh, go out and protest. Um, so that is her answer. I also believe that we are almost at time at 7.02. So I want to be mindful of the folks who are going to watch uh, a film. Um, so I wanted to thank Male for being with us, um, you know, before we start the film, um, and then I kick it back to the Action Lab folks. Eh, Mariela quería darle la gracia por reunirse con nosotros. Eh, las personas que están ahora en este grupo van a ver la película ahora, y, pero queríamos mm. ofrecerle una conversación antes para que tengan un contexto eh, más, más corriente de lo que está pasando en Chile. Uh, and, uh, okay, so... What I do know is that we're actually going to start the film right now. Um, so, folks, um, I hope you enjoy this film. It's called Primera. It's a documentary that uh, I directed and produced uh, over the course of 2020. It tells um, the rise of the Chilean social uprising, uh, ending with the plebiscite in 2020 that voted to, um, you know, um, in, in, write this new constitution. Um, the film is also... Um, playing on HBO Max. So if you are inspired and want to share the film with other folks, they can just, you know, tune in. They can just go and search and, um, you know, uh, type in Primera and they can see the film. Without further ado, I want to introduce the film. Uh, and please, you know, um, you know, reach out to me. You can find me on Facebook or Instagram, V Bravo, if you have any comments, concerns, or if you want to do something with the film and people like Mal in the future. All right. So take care. Thank you. Chao, Male. Chao a todos. Gracias.